Hello, everyone, and thank you once again for taking a work break with us and joining today's webinar. I'm going to give it just a couple of uh, minutes to let people get logged in. Uh, but while we're waiting, make sure you change your uh, chat group to all panelists and attendees. We would love to see uh, where you're coming from today. Go ahead and throw that into the chat box, see who's joining us um, and, and who's interested in listening to Blood Meridian. We will listen to Professor Michael Segrew's reflections on Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian. It's a newer classic novel with one of the darkest themes I've personally ever read. Written in 1985, reviews have said this epic is not for the faint of heart and has already made a significant impact in modern literature. We will explore the dark themes, styles, characters, and symbols, and hopefully have a lively discussion at the end. We're going to give everyone, like I said, a few more moments to log in and get settled. While we do that, please change that set, uh, chat panel to make sure you're sharing with all attendees and panelists. And let us know, once again, where you're joining from today. We'd love to hear from you. We are looking at today's webinar as a give and take discussion about Blood Meridian and would love to hear all of the questions that Dr. Segrew's lecture may inspire. So. Today, I once again have the great privilege of introducing and welcoming Dr. Michael Segrew to our ongoing webinar series, Classics Revisited. Dr. Segrew is a professor of history at Ave Maria University. He was a graduate of the Great Books Program. He earned his BA in history from the University of Chicago and his MA, Masters of Philosophy and PhD in history from Columbia University. Prior to taking his position at Ave Maria University, Professor Segrew taught at Princeton University, Columbia University, John Hopkins University, and so many more. I'm Christy Goebel, Global Marketing Specialist here at Biblioteca, and behind the scenes we have my colleague Marie Thorold helping to make sure everything runs smoothly and helping us monitor those chat and questions. We will be sharing the chat log with all attendees. So once again, final reminder to switch that setting to all attendees and panelists so that your uh, fellow attendees can see what you're chatting as well and any questions you may have there. If you do have specific questions uh, for the professor, please use the Q&A pop-out panel. The like button helps float the most popular questions to the top. So please use that feature if you see a similar question or something you want answered. Once again, we are looking at today's webinar as that give and take discussion. We've had some great discussions in the past on our previous books, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what people want to uh, hear about from this particular book. With that, I'm going to hand things over to Michael. We have pre-recorded his reflections and lecture in advance, but Dr. Sagru will join us at the end to take live questions. So please sit back and enjoy the lecture. Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian is uh, a celebrated novel, and it is a very powerful piece of work that calls upon a, a vast knowledge of earlier literature, going back to the earliest phases of written literature. Uh, the novel itself is a sort of an epic. It contains the journey motif which is, of course, which is, of course, what holds all of Western literature together, and it is particularly important in epic. Um, it has several epigrams, uh, epigraphs, rather, and uh, one of them I'd like to talk about when we look at the end or the finish today, the end of the book, um, is it, it's a note from a newspaper that said that in Ethiopia they had found a fossilized skull. It was 300,000 years old and it had been scalped. So I think the idea is that uh, violent, human on human violence is uh, not something new. It is in fact built into the human condition. There is a certain sort of pessimism about human nature that I might be tempted to, to describe as Augustinian. All right, there are no moral heroes here. Uh, instead, what we have is a kind of Foucauldian moral chaos where right and wrong don't exist, there's only power. And the weak are consumed by the strong. And uh, the questions that are connected to 
Western religion as well as Western literature uh, in inevitably emerge. And that's why McC Cormac McCarthy is often uh, compared to Dostoevsky. The biggest question, why are we here? What's the purpose of suffering? Does it have a purpose? Um, all get touched upon and they don't get any perfectly firm answer. Uh, McCarthy avoids cheap melodrama. There are no white hats and black hats in this Western. Instead, everybody's awful. It's a kind of Hobbesian nightmare, the war of all against all, and uh, no, no one and nothing can be trusted. Now, uh, the style is truly beautiful. You can't take anything from that. Uh, in, in many ways, uh, McCarthy seem, uh, reads like Faulkner with that beautiful flowing uh, clarity and uh, transparency, uh, not often uh, broken up with punctuation. So there's some very long and very powerful sentences. Also a certain gravity to his prose. Uh, it's a, a, a kind of seriousness that uh, people have sometimes described as uh, uh, biblical in its weightiness. And I think that's not far, far wrong. Now, Blood Meridian is also a kind of builder's roman. And what that means is that it's a novel of development or a novel of education. And in this case, we don't find out who the protagonist is. We know him as the kid and later on as the man, but he's anonymous. He is uh, in some ways uh, a cipher. It's hard to know what to think of him. Um, he is terrifically violent, but it's violence in the cause of self-preservation. It's not violence for violence sake. Uh, the kid leaves his home in Tennessee, goes down to New Orleans, where violence is, is the only way he can survive. From there, he drifts to Texas, and from Texas, he drifts into northern Mexico and eventually to California. Uh, he goes through Indian country, and he is killing all the way, all right? Now, he is not unique in that. Everyone is killing everyone else in Blood Meridian. This is an example of what genuine moral chaos looks like. Uh, if you know the painting by Hieronymus Bosch, The Garden of Earthly Delights, it has some of that terrifying imagery. Uh, nothing is wholesome. Everything is covered in blood. Uh, there's a kind of unapologetic recounting of death that reminds one of the Iliad. And... Uh, it's a meditation on evil that could be put next to Moby Dick. So uh, it's a very powerful, very profound, very serious novel. And it's about the clash of civilizations go that went on at the time of the Mexican-American War, right? This would be the late 18 or 1840s. And... Uh, It'll give us a little epilogue at the end of 1878 when we'll meet the kid in the form of the man. But the main body of the book is the kid's coming of age. And the foil to this is the judge. And the judge is one of the most terrifying creatures in all of literature. Uh, he is more than an American image. He's a terrifying universal image of evil. Yeah, in that respect, he might be compared to Milton Satan or Faust Mephistopheles. I mean, he's a grade A adversary. And he's not an adversary just to human beings. He's an adversary to God. Uh, in one of the more powerful lines, uh, he, ju the judge is talking to uh, the priest, an ex-seminarian. And the priest says, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. And the judge responds, how else would any well-formed man want to die? Which is a terrifying thought. And the judge simply announces, war is God. So the judge is a, a kind of inverted savior. He's a Satan figure like Milton presented us in Paradise Lost. Uh, he is also 
connected back to the earliest imagery of Satan, uh, the snake that we're going to get in the Garden of Eden, and the snake that destroys eternal life in Gilgamesh. Uh, the judge is a prodigy of death and darkness. And he has messianic tendencies, like Milton Satan, right? His pride is truly satanic and demonic. Um, he wants leadership, and that's the price he demands for telling the bedraggled uh, collection of scalp hunters how to make uh, gunpowder from saltpeter and sulfur that can be found in nature on a, uh, a dry volcano. In other, that scene is very much like the scene, the beginning of Goethe's Faust, when Faust sells his soul to the devil. Now, the judge is a liar. The first time we meet the judge, he tells a lie about a Christian minister and gets the Christian minister lynched. He says to the uh, revival meeting that the judge raped an 11 year old girl and had an improbable sexual relationship with a goat. Now the goat is not just a quadruped, it is also a symbol here. The judge retires away from the lynch mob and goes to a bar and announces that he does not know the parson, that he has never seen it before, and that the claims he made about raping a, an 11 year old and having sex with a goat um, were completely false. The men at the bar laugh and have another drink, while one assumes the uh, preacher is being lynched. This is a kind of diabolical entrance, and when we get to the point where he lives forever, one gets the sense that he's the personification of certain tendencies in human nature. Uh, satanic pride, certainly. He... Uh, only allows the universe to exist by his sufferance. He has a, a blank notebook in which he copies down and, and also illustrates some of the things he copies. By doing so, he gives them the ability to exist. He resents the fact that there's anything outside his ken which has the nerve to come into existence. Um, he is megalomaniacal. He lasts forever. And he is the enemy of clemency for what he calls the heathen. So they go on a, a rampage of murder and rape and arson and theft and destruction. Um, it's true pandemonium. And, and although they managed to kill off most of their enemies, a few stragglers emerge and uh, and take over uh, the ferry on the Yuma River. They use this as a brutal shakedown operation when settlers in ones, one and two and three wagon trains come and try and get brought across, across the uh, river. They kill them, rape the women, and steal their stuff. And they do this for, a, for an extended period of time. They've already killed off the local Indians and eventually they are driven away by the Indians and the American army. They end up, the uh, stragglers, which include the kid and the judge and a couple of others, they end up in San Diego and eventually Los Angeles. And the judge lies about the kid being involved or being the cause of the problem with the uh, scalp hunters. And he would have been killed, except that he slips out of the uh, jail cell and uh, he is enabled to go on and complete his education but he has met the father of lies and uh, he goes on and in the kids travels he eventually eventually encounters uh, a frozen couple and these frozen couple and this their horses have a frozen bible inside their pack, and he takes this. Now, this is a very interesting symbol because the kid's illiterate. So what would he do with the Bible? He could have taken anything. He could have taken gunpowder or uh, lead for making shot, or uh, he could have taken, you know, 
any kind of implement that he found useful. But instead, he decided to take something that wasn't useful. He took a Bible that he couldn't read. So I take this to mean that he's escaped the kind of crushing moral gravity of the judge. He's spun outside the judge's orbit. And he is no longer uh, a candidate for becoming a small version of the judge. In other words, he's decided to go in a different way. Um, in some respects, the decision to make a moral choice and to move in a different direction reminds me of another 20th century novel, which actually in, has many of the same concerns. And that would be uh, Anthony Burgess, A Clockwork Orange. All right. Uh, both of them are concerned with the question of evil. Both of them are concerned with um, the problem, the problems that emerge from medicalizing evil or from treating evil as a religious question. Um, religion doesn't have any way of explaining it. Re evil is, sim is a simple brute fact. The harder we try to create the odyssey, the more impossible it becomes. If you uh, remember when the judge and the uh, remains of the Glanton gang are crossing the desert. Uh, the judge tries to kill the priest and fails, but does shoot him in the neck and the priest can't stop the bleeding. I have to think this is symbolic blood, all right? Uh, the fact that he's a priest or at least was a seminarian suggests that he too has that clemency for the heathen. And he is the one that does his best to confront the judge, but he's merely human and can't ultimately get the job done. Uh, the judge is the adversary and the kid eventually takes a shot at him, tries to kill him, but misses. And this is actually, again, one of those symbolic misses. Uh, the judge, as he says at the end of the book, cannot be killed. And the fact that he cannot be killed uh, suggests that this is a permanent feature of human life. Uh, one of the other epi epigraphs at the beginning of the book says that death and dark, or rather, uh, death is the very life of the darkness. And that's true. The life of the judge, who is the darkness, who is evil, who is the adversary, um, he lives off death. And that's why he thinks God, war is God. And that's why at the end of the book, we have the very peculiar ending that's caused a lot of controversy among literary critics. You have to consider this, all right? The, ki the kid who is now the man, grown up, meets the judge at a saloon in Texas in 1878. The judge has not aged at all. He still wears the same white suit that set him off from everyone else. And he also um, is still a, a killer and uh, uh, an instigator, as well as a participant in genocide. The judge feeds off that. Okay. The judge recognizes the man as the former kid who escaped his malevolent influence and the judge says, you still have clemency for the heathen. And I take that to mean that the man, the kid who became a man still has not abandoned all humanity, has some spark of love and solidarity, even with what the judge calls the heathen. And this is the only thing that separates human life and human civilization from the law of the jungle, red in tooth and claw, that the kid experienced early on. The judge is trying to extinguish that small spark of goodness. And he, try, he, he succeeded with the preacher when he had him lynched, but the kid escaped him, became a man a man with a frozen Bible in his 
saddlebag. The judge is antagonistic towards the kid and belligerent. And the kid says, you ain't nothing. And I take that to be a very serious, very solemn statement because McCarthy draws upon so many books from the Western canon. I think what this draws upon is St. Augustine's definition of evil, which is as a privation, as an absence. You ain't nothing means that literally he is an absence. He's a void. He's a vacuum. This is what death is. This is what the darkness is. And uh, I think when he identifies the judge for who he is, the judge can't bear that anyone should share in the special gnosis that he has. And so the judge follows him out to the toilet and kills him there with his bare hands. He then goes back into the saloon and dances naked. And the judge, dancing naked, sings that he will never die. Simultaneously, looking outside, two cowboys go to the Jakes, they open the door, and they say, oh my God, they're horrified by what they see. Um, the text does not tell us what they see. Uh, Cormac McCarthy can be very subtle and leave things very open-ended. But in my view, what they find is the kid dressed up in the gigantic judge's seven foot tall suit. So he looks like a baby in a giant's white suit and his neck is broken or his throat is cut or something along those lines. But it's some hor horrific scene of the, of the man back in something like swaddling clothes. <laughs> On the other hand, the judge is now naked. So he's in the saloon dancing and he's dancing and he says the dance will go on forever and I will never die. I will never die. And I think the reference here is to the Epic of Gilgamesh. Remember that in Gilgamesh, it's the snake that denies Gilgamesh and everybody else in the world, the plant of eternal life. So it's the snake that causes people to be mortal. Okay, the reason why the uh, Babylonians and the Mesopotamians generally treated snakes as a symbol of evil is because they're an immediate source of sudden death, all right? So snakes and their connection to death and fear and suffering, very clear. Also, ancient herpetology was not very advanced. Uh, the ancient Mesopotamians noted that snakes shed their skin. So they had the belief that snakes lived forever and that when they shed their skin, they began another lifetime. That's why it's a snake that eats the plant of eternal life that Gilgamesh brings back because snakes are thought to be immortal. Okay. Now, here we have the judge claiming to be immortal and what I think that when he takes off his uh, ice cream man white suit and puts, puts it on uh, the man after he's killed him, I think what he's done is shed his skin because I think that he's the serpent from Gilgamesh. That's how I think it connects to that epigraph about the ancient uh, skull that had been scalped. This has been going on forever, and evil never gets old. Death is always reaching out its dark and sparkling hands. There's a little epigraph, which I think is very powerful to the book. This is later on. The 19th century is over, I guess, or maybe we're at the turn of the century. A team of surveyors are not just surveying the open prairie, they are setting up Cartesian coordinates using 
fence posts and barbed wire. And what they are doing is making rational and taming the American West. If any of you know uh, the uh, anecdote of the jar, uh, when uh, there's a, a jar on the hill in Tennessee, making everything around it become coherent. Well, uh, this is rather like that. It is creating coherence and order inside nature, which has been resistant to that. The state of nature has been full of death and disaster. A funny kind of surreal thing is noted in this uh, process of digging these post holes. Sparks come up when the shovels go down and they ignite small fires. I take this to mean the civilization is a very thin, very fragile, evanescent crust that's formed over the roof of hell. And while Freud may be onto something when he says that civilization has its discontents, this is Cormac McCarthy's way of saying that the lack of civilization has far greater discontents. This is his limited apologia for civilization. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. And if you could now join us by turning your camera on, that would be great. There we, there we go. Hello, sir. How are you today? Um, so for those of you who um, it looks like our question and answer panel is a little bit bare right now, but that's okay. That was a very uh, heavy, <laughs> deep book to uh, take in. So please feel free to uh, write uh, your questions into the Q&A panel. Uh, as we get a chance to uh, speak with uh, Michael here. I do have a couple of questions and some questions did come in from the registration that we'll go ahead and get started with. Uh, one is a very simple one. And I have to say that at first I, was, I read it before I read the book, which I've only done in the past couple of weeks. And um, it's, it's a good question because I do have the same one. Um, is very simple, why the shooting of the bear? Why the shooting of the bear? Um, one of the great things about Cormac McCarthy is that, uh, or one of the great things about the way he handles violence is that for the most part, it doesn't symbolize anything. In other words, we shoot the bear for the same reason we shoot the Indians, because they're there and because we can, not for any good reason. It's the opposite of having good reason. And that's the point of the moral chaos. So yeah, I mean, uh, nobody gets out alive except the judge. Okay, uh, that's a that's a great answer, and it it does tend to trend with a couple of the other questions I have for you later on. Uh, but I'd like to actually bring our audience into what you and I were kind of speaking about uh, prior to getting started today. Was in your lecture you mentioned that McCarthy's writing in Blood Meridian could you know can almost be called Faulkner like you know it's very descriptive. Uh, occasionally long-winded stream of consciousness. You and I have talked a little bit about that. Um, and after reading it, I certainly agree with you. Um, now, this is the only McCarthy book I have ever read. Um, I know he has a, a great library of books that he's written. I've seen the film No Country for Old Men, which is based on one of his books. But is this generally his writing style in all of his books? Or was this kind of very specific for this narrative and epic? Um he is clearly a descendant of Faulkner, but I think that he has a, a, more, a, more, a more universal set of concerns. Faulkner is, I think, a deeply regional writer in the way that McCarthy isn't. Um, it's said in the, uh, uh, this novel is set in the desert, but it could be just as easily set on a whaling ship or on an ice floe. Uh, he's talking about universal things in the way that Dostoevsky is. Uh, it's not that Faulkner does not make grand gestures, that he's just much more subtle about them. 
Okay. Okay. Now is this, so is that kind of a thematic style of writing yeah. throughout a lot of McCarthy's other Faulkner. books as well? Okay. Everybody, everybody that reads it and knows Faulkner says that, you know, it's clear that he's uh, not imitating this, but yeah. rather uh, he's, uh, he's building on it. Okay. Okay, interesting. Now you just brought up, uh, brought up uh, Dostoevsky uh, in that answer, as well as a couple of times in, in your lecture. You also brought up Faust, Gilgamesh, all of which have very dark themes, stories, traditions, and, and this uh, uh, of, of darkness and, and, and hell and, and, and the layers that all of them bring in. Uh, clearly in, in, in Blood Meridian, so does McCarthy. Um, is there any light or hope that you see in Blood Meridian with the narrative, or is it truly just a tale of evil? Um, I actually do, um, but it's a very, it's a very grayish right, light. Okay, it's a, it's a, a kind of a dusk of moonlight. All right, so it's not perhaps the uh, light of the sun that we might all like, but it's not pitch black. <clears throat> I think the key is in the final coda where they are imposing rational order on nature. Okay. Now it's fashionable nowadays to uh, have good words to speak for primitivism and uh, uh, you know things like against the grain and the idea that civilization is stifling. You know, it goes back to Rousseau and also, I mean, all the way back to Tacitus in some ways talking about how uncorrupted, you know, the other is. And uh, we certainly see that tendency in something like Freud, civilization as discontents. Yeah, it's easy to say in 20th century, or early 20th century Vienna, yes, it is stifling. We can't, you know, exercise our sexual and aggressive impulses the way we would like. McCarthy's point is that these people have become spoiled by the high quality of civilization that they have and take for granted. If you take civilization away, which is the human condition at least since 300,000 BC, what you have is variations on the theme of one group committing genocide on the other. And in fact, um, one of the most worrisome things that I've seen as a historian is that this new information coming out of the Harvard Medical School Historical Genetics Lab, and it turns out that genocidal destruction is far more uh, frequently seen than anyone had suspected. And the problem is, is that the DNA is dispositive. In other words, uh, it has the last word because you can't fake that. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not unique to the American West. It's everywhere. Um, if I might give you one example, the people who built Stonehenge were completely unrelated in a genetic sense to the people who defended England in 1066. Mm -hmm. In that 3,500 years, they had wiped them all out. So this is a universal human problem. And uh, what he said, what McCarthy is saying is, look, you can have hell or you can have the sort of purgatory we live in. Make the smart decision. <laughs> Interesting. I never really put it together that, that um, evil or purgatory could almost bring hope to you. Uh, but that's an interesting answer. Uh, we did get one question in here. Uh, do you see any special meaning or symbolism in the judge's hat that is crafted by combining two hats? <laughs> I don't know what it means. In other words, there are times when um, I feel like I'm just forcing it. And I've looked at that and tried to read into the judge's clothing. I don't know what to do with it. Um, it seems that since white is uh, uh, in the West, uh, generally associated with purity, um, it seems ironic that he should be walking around like an ice cream man. And uh, particularly in the American desert Southwest and the two hats, he wants it all. Um, his desires are unlimited, but I really don't know. I'm a, when, I, when I don't know, I just try and say so. <laughs> well, continuing on the judge, because obviously uh, he is a, 
uh, quite famous fictional character at this point, one of the more evil ones that I have ever personally read for sure. Um, and actually, I was as I was researching this, there were a lot of quotes as the, the judge is one of the main reasons why uh, no one has even attempted to do Blood Meridian as a cinematic uh, adventure, as a movie, because no one can quite make him as as evil as it is in the book. But if the judge cannot be killed, as you were kind of saying at the end, does that mean that um, whether it's McCarthy or McCarthy is leading us to that solution, does that mean that evil or lack of morality will always be a part of the human condition and we're just accepting accepting that as part of the human condition? Um, <clears throat> monotheism is to a great extent a philosophy of resignation. You res the monotheist believer is resigned to the fact that evil exists. That's the point of the book of Job. Mm. Now, eventually, there's the idea of redem redemption, but evil is here to stay. Nobody knows why, and it doesn't make any sense. So I don't. I think that McCarthy's meditation on it is that this is evil is often not symbolic of anything in McCarthy. Evil is just evil, and that's one of the things that's so disturbing about it. In other words, when he talks about uh, the uh, Comanches riding after the people who had rustled the cattle. And if you remember that scene where there's one paragraph of Comanches dressed in various kinds of clothing they had taken and covered in blood. And uh, if you've ever read any of the history of the Comanches, that's not inaccurate. In other words, uh, the amount of bloodletting and cruelty and awful stuff that went on there by everybody from every side, made it a perfect meditation on the idea of hell. Um, but you see, it's like what Alex says in A Clockwork Orange. Um, everybody wonders where evil comes from, but nobody wonders what that implies for the good. Hmm. I think we're talking is by implication of religious believer. Well, and, and as you were saying, like the Southwest at that time, um, like th this was, this is clearly a, a fictional story, but it is generally based on things that were happening, like the Comanches, the um, almost militia type armies that were going and thinking that they were defending the government, but it was really a bloodbath, the, the uh, you know, private gangs of scalpers to, to kill them. Um, so is that one of the reasons you think that McCarthy picked that time was because in, in that sense, the border of New Mexico, Texas, Mexico, it, it was considered hell? He's not writing history, but he's writing something in a way more accurate than history. Mm -hmm. No historian is ever going to know about the terror and the bloodlust. He can fill that in for us, mm -hmm. which, you know, he has poetic license and can do that. Um, but that means that it's truer than history. It's more real than history in a way. And uh, he, what he's showing us is the underlying moral reality of the human condition, mm -hmm. all right? We are lucky to have the civilization we have. Stop whining about it. That's part of why I, uh, when I taught the great books, um, I used to finish my great books course with McCarthy's Blood Meridian saying, yeah, warts and all, um, I prefer civilization to the absence of civilization because M McCarthy scared the bejesus out of me. <laughs> Fair enough. Now, going on McCarthy, and, and uh, we have a question here from, from an audience member saying, do you know what inspired Blood Meridian and why McCarthy chose to tell this story? Oh, well, um, he moved to New Mexico and he was very interested in the mixing of cultures and also in the real historical circumstances by which um, our civilization was imposed upon the people there and upon nature. And he found out that it was astonishingly horrifying and brutal. But what he also found out, if you were, there's a wonderful book called uh, Empire of the Summer Moon, it's a history of the Comanches. And uh, before Europeans got there, um, Indians were not lacking in imagination with regard to awful things to do to each other. In other words, when you had uh, Europeans come, they just added to the mix and brought a bunch of diseases. But it was pretty much like that, like Ethiopia and that 300,000 year old skull. This is happening everywhere. 
we're all implicated in that. Uh, Cain and Abel have been enacted throughout our history. And that's what he's talking about, I think. Okay. Um, I, have a, I have a question from an audience member, but I'm gonna get to that in just a moment because I have a, a leading question into the more modern times for sure. But this is certainly the most modern title in our list of books that we've talked about so far, as well as that we're going to talk about in the next couple of lectures that we have you for. Um, why do you like to lecture on this book? You kind of just answered that at the end of your great book series, but, but why do you th what do you think its significance is and will be on literature around the world? Well, my, what I think is that this is the most important American novel of the 20th century. You know, there, it's arguable, it's debatable, but I think that this has all the, uh, the signs of something that's still going to be read in 100 years. And what it is, is instead of three cheers for civilization, it's one cheer for civilization. In other words, having looked it over, he's saying, look, um, with all its mis difficulties and imperfections, uh, we have done very well in creating civilization. And there's a certain sort of, I put it, uh, ingratitude in those that are constantly criticizing without recognizing how much they've gotten from civilization that they didn't do anything for. Consider the fact that we don't have intestinal worms or 50% infant mortality or uh, uh, blood vendetta. We haven't done anything to actually enact those. Our ancestors did. This is something we get from civilization. Okay. Um, so going into that, um, especially the modern way of thinking of while well, we're reading this, because obviously it's a more modern novel written in 1985 about the 1840s. Once again, we're, we're in that classic times, but um, can you see similarities in the current political figures and the situation in the story? And if so, can you elaborate? Well, the judge says he will never die. And that's true. Even though we construct civilization as a, a very thin crust over hell itself, which is what we had to start to work with to begin with. Um, it doesn't mean that we've abolished the judge. The judge is still here. His malevolence takes different forms, but these, I mean, the violence that we see impulsively engaged in by the kid um, probably has its analog in the scenes of mass violence that we see in terrorism or in school shootings. I mean, evil still is real. And that's, of course, part of the uh, attraction both of Dostoevsky and of McCarthy. Now, that question was more on the, the current political. As I was doing um, research on the book to, to prep for the webinar, I kept seeing an interpretation of the no novel as a comment on the expansionist doctrine of a manifest destiny, the idea, you know, that ideology. Um, and, and that it had renewed relevance in the context of the 1980s with the American foreign policy um, being Reagan's administration kind of becoming trying to build up the military, become a stronghold, more of a stronghold in, in uh, the Midwest or Midwest, <laughs> the Middle East. Um, and do you think McCarthy picking this time frame and this violent way of settling the Southwest is a comment on America's, primarily Reagan's, because that was the time that it was written, you know, build up? It might be. Um, I don't think that he's the 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 filibuster expeditions, which is mm -hmm. what they were mistaken for to begin with. Um, those were full of bloodthirsty, genocidal people. The the Mexicans that they encountered were bloodthirsty, genocidal people, and the Indians that encountered both of them were bloodthirsty, genocidal people. So um, he doesn't like the conduct or the moral status of any of these people. And he's probably right about that. I mean, there may have been some saintly people, you know, removed from this, but uh, my guess is that when they encountered this, they didn't last long. So I don't see short-term political concerns as being a big deal with McCarthy. Look at the epigraphs in the beginning of the book. They go back to 300,000 BC. So uh, you could probably force a, a Reagan, an anti-Reagan, anti-manifest destiny argument onto it. And yeah, he does. He certainly d dislikes manifest destiny, except insofar as it was what's going to generate this civilization, this thin crust over hell. 
Now, it, that might have been done by either the Indians or the Mexicans. But he just says, look, somebody put a crust over hell, and then we should hang on to it. All right. So uh, I don't know how much it was concerned with the 1980s. That's that's great. I was I, like I said, it kept popping up in a couple of different interpretations, and I was I was kind of curious. I actually had to research the Reagan administration again because that is not an area that I had done a lot of research on. Um, one of the questions that came in, getting back to the characters and the symbolism in the books, um, in the book itself, um, how do you see the inclusion of the caged idiot James Bell? That is the most difficult, or. That is the most difficult symbol in the book. Um, I have heard some very uh, heated arguments and that, and I must confess, I don't have a good answer. But the heated arguments I have heard have been that it represents the, uh, the subconscious or the unconscious element in the human mind, which the judge has externalized. But I have heard equally vehement arguments to the contrary. Now, when people become vehement, particularly in the soft sciences, what that means is nobody really knows, right? Uh, it, when people do know, they're very quiet and soft-spoken about it because they really know what they're talking about. So it's been the, uh, the subject of quite a bit of controversy, like the alleged pedophilia of the judge. You know, he, uh, is, uh, he, he sits an Indian boy on his leg and we never see him again. This means that, it, in some interpretations, the judge raped and killed the boy. I don't see it that way. My problem with that is the judge is like a giant infant. He's prepubescent. He has no body hair, right? So he's a, he's a giant 300. He's a human analog of Moby Dick. I mean, that's seriously. I mean, he says a giant white whale who happens to be a human being rather than a sea mammal. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when he's naked, He's hairless from head to toe. So that's why I don't see him as a symbol of virility. I, I see him as a symbol of eternal youth and childhood. Which comes into the immortal side. So, so speaking of eternal youth and childhood, I, I had this question. I kept waiting for this aha moment as I read it, uh, as I read the book, but it, it never came fully to me. So, you know, basically what does the kid represent although violent from the start and a survivalist for sure as you said he maintains a mild amount of mercy and kindness that is almost demonized by the judge throughout the book the judge wins for lack of a better term in the end by killing the kid so would you say that this means evil will always win out in human nature or is there a bigger picture here as to what the kid represents overall in the book well um my view is not as dark as that. I don't think evil wins out. Um, he kills the kid, the judge kills the kid, but look, the kid, like all mortals, is going to die. That's not the problem. Um, the problem is, can we extricate ourselves from the bottom of Dante's Inferno into a mess that we like better? Yes, evil will still be operative there, but we won't be scalping people on a regular basis, which happens constantly. I thought from, um, uh, I reread it since I, I had a little discussion and it occurs to me, you know what might have happened? What might be a way of explaining that outhouse scene where the kid is dead? I think he's in the judge's giant ice cream suit, but it occurred to me, I wonder if the judge didn't scalp him the idea being that since he has clemency for the heathen, he gets treated like the heathen, right? Okay. So in that respect, uh, he was looking for and had some inchoate faith in moral order. That's why he takes a book that he can't read because he knows the only book that's around is the Bible. So he takes that on, on faith that this is some sort of talisman, some sort of representation of moral order. He can't read it, unfortunately, but I think that it's the it's vying and competing with the judge's notebook. These are two alternative books, the book of man and the book of God. So uh, yeah, this, there's something frightening like Captain Ahab in the judge. And he's also like Milton Satan. I mean, he's got this gigantic pride. So uh, 
I don't know exactly how to pull all the parts of this together. Uh, one of the things about McCarthy is that he can be extraordinarily subtle and also extraordinarily terrifying. I mean, there are scenes that here that I will never be able to get out of my subconscious. That there's a point at which he, he says, uh, it's a long paragraph about the Comanche Raiders. And the turn of phrase I remember is death hilarious. Now it had never occurred to me that death might be hilarious, but this sort of hilarity is not an enjoyable sort of laughter. And uh, yeah, I had never juxtaposed those words before and I can't get it out of my head. Now going along the dark, uh, dark themes, I have two more questions here unless uh, other questions do pop in from the audience. The, the judge, and we've talked a little bit about this, the judge says simply that war endures because young men love it and old men love it in them. What's more, all true servants of war become gods themselves with dominion over the earth, essentially boiling it down to, to what you said, the, the famous quote in the book, war is God. What do you believe... Um, McCarthy was trying to relate to the readers with this ideal since to me at least it's a very depressing one if war is God uh, with the religious faith that I have. Gods come and go apparently and you can trade in old ones for new ones and not every trade in is an equivalent trade. You can trade up, you can trade down. Uh, I think McCarthy is suggesting it, that uh, from war is God, any trade you make is up. <laughs> so at the end, when we have these guys digging these Cartesian post holes, uh, turning the uh, wilderness into uh, a logical structure, um, yeah, this is a, a repudiation of that dis moral disorder in favor of uh, a new God, a new regime, a new civilization, and a new chance not to backslide and fall into what was the human condition for 300,000 years. Have a care when you disparage the culture and civilization we have. So this is his meditation in a way on Thomas Hobbes' political philosophy. This is the war of all against all. It's easy when you're sitting in front of a computer screen in an air-conditioned room to say, you know, Civilization is getting on my nerves. If any of you have seen that, that uh, show that they have, uh, Naked and Afraid, where the people are dropped off in uh, <laughs> the jungle, uh, civilization, they find out very quickly how much they like civilization. <laughs> All right, finally, um, and this may have jumped out to me a little bit more just because of our current uh, situation, at least in the US, but, but many killers in the novel justify their violence in large part by demonizing their enemy, uh, which is very true of the human condition throughout time. It's one of the reason, main reasons people go to war is they, they come up with an excuse to demonize their enemy to, enemy to go to war. But I noticed a lot of it was especially by race um, or, you know, genocide, you know, like Mexicans, Apaches, Indians, you know, all of that, all, uh, yet all the races in the book are both good and bad relatively um, or interchangeable throughout the book, i.e. black and white Jackson constantly antagonize each other based on each other's race, yet they both do it. So you can't really say that black is better than white or white is better than black in the Jackson brother, not brothers, but Jackson characters, or Captain White, for example, demonizes the Mexicans by calling them barbarians, yet encourages barbaric behaviors in his own army of white men, while we see the Mexicans at times being much more civil than, than they are being. What are your thoughts on McCarthy's statements or views of race, both in the period of the book was set, his present day, our present day? Like, what do you think we can draw from these racial disparities? Um. <laughs> it's a tough one, but my inclination would be to say that uh, no race gets idealized. In other words, he doesn't take any uh, cheap shots by giving us a, a kind of noble savagism. Uh, the, he, since he knows the actual history, uh, the, the Apache were a very large, very fierce tribe. And during the historical time in the, in the 19th century, um, they were almost completely destroyed by the Comanche. Mm -hmm. So the Indians are not one big monolithic thing, and they will be happy to tell you that if you ask. 
so are the white people. The difference between filibusters and the United States Army and the white people that you meet in LA and San Diego, um, they're not unified. In fact, they get they hang a bunch of them. Uh, Tobin and Toadvine get hanged in uh, in LA. So, uh, and I'm sure that the Mexicans are are equally bad. They're paying the uh, Clanton gang to go get scalps. And of course, the Clanton gang scalps everybody indiscriminately. And that means that they're actually setting the Klan gang on other Mexicans. In other words, there are no good people here. That's what's so Augustinian about this. Mm-hmm. The element of hope, the element of redemption lies in the possibility of creating a civilization that's not good, but better than the hell we are in naturally. And that's an, I mean, that's an interesting kind of pessimistic conservatism. Um, okay, we got one final question before we just move on to, to wrap up the webinar. Oh, two. Okay, I'll read the last two. I apologize if anybody else comes in. Um, what do you make of Glanton killing for money, money as a theme in other parts of the book? Yeah. Um, money turns out to be, uh, as Marx put it, the abstract form of human desire. And what that means is that unlimited unleashed libido will generate uh, the same lust for money that the kid dreams about when he's under the influence of ether. And remember that he has that uh, dream or ether hallucination of a coin counterfeiter. the counterfeit coin here, I think, is the satisfaction of libido. It's not what's really good for you. It's not what's really desirable, despite the fact that people often desire it. So money, I think, represents uh, the, the basest and most dangerous of desires. Okay. Um, and then the final question, um, I touched on this a little bit, but more specifically to Blood Meridian than, than McCarthy overall. The final question I have is, uh, why or what do you think McCarthy's impact or influence on literature overall will be? Well, it's sort of, it, McCarthy's views remind me, not his style, but his views remind me of uh, Anthony Burgess, who wrote A Clockwork Orange. And if I were to see a movie version of this, I can't imagine anybody doing it justice except Stanley Kubrick, all right? And that I would be terrified by, but let me come back. Um, These are people who are examining the breakdown of culture or of Western culture and uh, are not trying to defend it because look, it's full of evil, but are pointing out that actually evil is more ubiquitous than anybody realizes and the idea of abolishing it with any quick fix, with any sets of laws or institutions or such stuff, um, it reminds me of that old song by the Who, we won't get fooled again. Um, we can improve society, but we cannot perfect it. And the perfect is the enemy of the better. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for your time today, uh, Michael. I appreciate it. It was a great conversation, great questions from the audience. I'm glad that I, you know, I feel a little guilty. I, I love getting to ask you questions, but I know that you and I get time before and after each <laughs> each lecture as well. Um, but uh, we appreciate it and, and, and getting a chance to take a break with a more modern classic for sure. But as you said, I'm, I'm pretty sure this one will be being read and studied and analyzed a um, hundred years from now for sure. Um, If you are enjoying the Classics Revisited series with uh, Professor Sagru, we have two more titles that will be aired this year with Shakespeare's Measure for Measure being our next lecture on Tuesday, November 24th. So two weeks away, please join us. It will be at the same time. Um, We have also have a webinar coming up this Thursday on the 12th for an education series. We are partnering with the Education Department, their Development Center on. Uh, It will focus on the social and emotional learning that is happening currently in libraries. Uh, Please make sure you visit biblioteca.com forward slash events to register to join us for any of our webinars. They also have all of our on-demand, all of the lectures that Michael has done so far for us throughout October, as well as any other on-demand webinars that you may be interested in seeing that we've been doing since May of this year. If the dates and times don't work for you, you can always watch one of those on-demand. 
And finally, as we finish up today, we would love for everybody to complete a, a quick survey that'll pop up in your browser as you sign off. Um, it just lets us know how you've enjoyed our work break with the classics. If you have any questions or maybe title suggestions, because we have been talking about possibly continuing the series um, into next year, please leave them in the follow up survey that will pop up as you log off. And with that, from everyone at Biblioteca, thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Michael, once again, for leading today's thank discussion. Bye-bye.